Cabin Sports Radio. Here comes the siren. I want to go higher. Oh, my goodness. Cabin Sports Radio back on the Cabin Radio Airwaves for another week. Big show coming up for you tonight. Canada Winter Games update. We are going to recap everything that's going on down in Red Deer. Mr. Ollie Williams is there following all the action. One week until the NHL trade deadline. We'll talk about that as well. NBA All-Star Weekend, CFL, bunch of jerks, all coming up on Cabin Sports Radio. The CSR Podcast. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you as always by Sport North, moving sport forward. Mr. Mike Gibbons joins me in the studio once again. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Not bad. How was your weekend? It was good. Yeah. Caught some uh, NBA All-Star action. Lovely. It was pretty good. Missed the celebrity game on Friday, though, but I couldn't care less. Uh, the activity on Saturday, Sunday, pretty good. Not into the celebrity game? No. no. Okay. No, we don't care. Don't want to see Didn't those old tell. guys. I think J. Cole, uh, the halftime performer on Sunday, I, I think he played. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, you know what? Actually, a little going off uh, off track here a little bit. Uh, he was featured. Uh, he didn't participate, but he was featured in the dunk contest. Oh. There's there's one point. Uh, someone tried to dunk over him. I, I forget which participant oh, it was. No. Pretty cool. He was sitting in a chair. But then he just grabs a ball from the, the a sitting formation, turns around, and almost throws one down, which is pretty impressive. No one saw that coming. Wow. Wow. Uh, he bricked it, but it's it looked good. God, the NBA He's, All-Star game. He still got hops. It's yeah. just so much cooler than the it, NBA they, they or make the it, NHL. They make it pretty cool. Ah, man. Okay, well, we're going to talk uh, more about that a little bit later on in the show. You can give us a whole recap sure. of the NBA All-Star weekend. Uh, I flicked it on for a second, actually, and I thought it was was the actual All-Star game, but it was the uh, the alumni game. Yes. Well, they, they looked like they were moving pretty good. They still got it. <laughs> they got the uh, the rising stars too. They they change formats, uh, so it's not rookies versus sophomores anymore. It's Team USA. Ah. It's got to be you know Planet USA. Well, of course, versus everybody. That's right. Uh, versus the world. Uh, That's right. Featured. We got another Space Jam on the way. Right. After yeah. All. Uh, another fun game. Um, Team USA ended up winning, but right people as they should. Yeah, as they should. Yeah. Okay, well, we will talk. Uh, we will give you a full recap of the NBA All Star Game a little bit later on in the show, uh, as well. Team NT Canada Winter Games first weekend uh, in the books. Uh, oh man, some huge stories coming out of that tournament already. Uh, team NT doing some really cool things. I don't know if you saw the story about Team Nunavut, the hockey team, won their first game, their first ever game Whoa. at a Canada Winter Games. Just a collection of of players from, I think, five different communities in Nunavut played their first ever game at the Canada Winter Games and beat Team Yukon 5-3. Very cool. Yeah. We were talking about it a bit earlier on Mornings at the Cabin. Uh, Jesse and I firmly with Team Nunavut. Mm -hmm. Team NT, Team Nunavut, we're kind of against... Team UConn. Yeah. They're kind of like the odd sure. territory out. You know, they're like the privileged territory. Team NT had a very good showing against Newfoundland yes. as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah. and their, uh, their, their tournament opener had a very good showing and, uh, and have done well since then. Mm. But we will have a uh, full recap of everything. Team NT coming up with Mr. Ollie Williams. He is, of course, down there with the Sport North uh, mission staff for Team NT and covering everything that happens with that team. So we will hear from him. Uh, in the next segment here on Cabin Sports Radio. We're going to start off, though, uh, with the NHL. We are exactly one week away from the NHL trade deadline. Of course, that goes down Monday, February 25th, noon, maybe. I'm not actually sure when the actual time deadline is. But by this time, by the time you hear us next week, Mm -hmm. everything will be said and done as far as the trade deadline goes, and we will be recapping uh, possibly many moves, possibly no moves. Right. Might be one of those uh, those rare opportunities where the TSN staff gets to go on air yeah. for a whole day and really not talk about a whole lot. That's pretty bold, eh? You'll dedicate that much programming to uh, to a trade deadline, and you, you do run the risk of absolutely nothing happening, and you still have to fill 
what they they're they're there for like ten hours sometimes. Oh, they they must be so prepared for it by yeah. now. Like they must be so used to the inevitable trade deadline yeah. crickets. Yeah, and they just have like so many things scheduled. It, I I bet it's kind of a challenge that they look forward to now. Mm-hmm. Like, how are we going to fill yeah. this stupid amount of airtime we have dedicated to this event that may not be exciting right. at all? On the other end of the spectrum, it could be extremely exciting, which would make. That 10 hours or so go by very quickly. Yes. But you do, of course, run the risk of uh, a lot of organizations just holding firm. Yes. Making no moves. Then you don't really have much to talk about. So this Monday is lining up as of right now to be a pretty interesting trade deadline. The way things are looking, there are still so many variables, pending moves, teams that are kind of in limbo deciding whether or not they are in a situation where they want to push forward with what they have or cut their losses trade some assets, get some future considerations and that sort of thing. And we're going to talk about a few of those teams right Mm. now. Uh, The first one that has to come to mind, of course, is the Ottawa Senators. They have two big names. Uh, Really, one of them, kind of the heart and soul of the club ever since, you know, Daniel Alfredson parted ways. Uh, Mark Stone. Mm. He is a big one. And, of course, Matt Duchesne, who has only been there for, uh, for two seasons now, but is a pretty important piece on that team as well. A lot of questions that now we're kind of starting to figure out the answers to that Mm -hmm. those two guys not looking like they're going to be in the club's future. Did you just throw some shade at Eric Carlson by not throwing his name in there? Oh, wow. For the uh, the heart and soul? (laughs) My goodness. My apologies, Eric Carlson. He might take some offense to that. Oh, Um, man. So the latest... uh, He'll never be on this show. (laughs) The latest coming out of uh, Ottawa now, they have reportedly re-engaged Mark Stone. Uh, so if there is one of them that they will retain, they will look to do so with Mark Stone. Uh, and I believe we talked about it last week with um, uh, Eugene Melnick saying they want to spend close to the cap. I believe it was from the years 2021 to 2024-25 type, right. type period. Uh, effectively saying they're not looking to be overly competitive spending tons of money for the next three seasons or so but if they would like to have one of them in that picture uh in that sort of bridge period and then hopefully beyond they have reportedly re-engaged uh with mark stone and his agents we'll see if that comes to fruition at all in the in the in the form of some form of extension um but it does the writing is on the wall it seems like uh of the two of them matt duchene is very available. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently one of the teams that they're in close talks with right now, which does make sense, uh, Winnipeg. Um, and I believe it was Shevel Dayoff. He's the general manager. Yeah, Kevin Shevel Dayoff. Yeah. He, uh, this was weeks ago, uh, made it clear that the, their first round pick is up for grabs. They are willing to part with that. Uh, they're obviously a true contender uh, in the Western Conference and the Central Division. Uh, one move away. Like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, they made that Paul Stastny play yep. last year fit in really nicely. Yeah. Uh, so they can get another strong forward. You you like to think that um, that's a move that they would like to make. Uh, and apparently the Ottawa GM and other staffers are in Winnipeg for four days. Uh, maybe they can hash something out. Yeah, very similar situation for the Jets uh, this year as, as, as this time last year. Yeah, like you say, just... Basically looking for that right one more piece. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a forward. That's what they need. Uh, Whether or not it's a winger or a center, it's kind of it's kind of up in the air. They can they can make do with both, but it has to be a top six kind of guy. It has to be a quality guy. And obviously, like you mentioned, uh, they are willing to part ways with a first round draft pick. Mm -hmm. So you know the Jets are are a major contender to land possibly a Mark Stone, possibly a Matt Duchesne, mm-hmm. or possibly one of these guys from a few other teams that are, again, possibly on the bubble. The, the, the reason that you know all eyes are on Ottawa is because as opposed to some of these other teams we're going to talk about, Ottawa's not going anywhere. No. <laughs> they are firmly entrenched in the basement in mm-hmm. the Eastern Conference. They have no illusions of suddenly getting hot and saving this season and turning things around. No. That is not going to happen for the Ottawa Senators. So that... Seems like the most obvious reason to move a big piece like that and get some pieces back uh, and then, yeah, look to the future for for that club. Um, as opposed to that, 
Now, we're going to run down a few other teams that we've been talking about for, you know, the past couple weeks, looking ahead to the trade deadline and thinking, what are they going to do? Uh, the most interesting one has been the St. Louis Blues. Mm. Since the All-Star break, the Blues have been the hottest team in the NHL. They're currently on a 10-game winning streak. Had an awful start to the season, an absolutely atrocious start to the season. Now we're on a 10-game winning streak, have won 11 of their last 12 Currently running or riding rather a three game shutout streak. Yeah. Jake Allen has one of those three shutouts. Uh, the other one, Jordan Binnington. Mm. Who? Yeah. Jordan Binnington. If you haven't Touché. heard of him, he may be playing himself into a nice NHL contract and future career. Mm. He's only 25 years old and he's become a bit of a sensation. He's played 16 games so far for the St. Louis Blues. Has a 12 1 and 1 record, a 152 goals against average, 937 save percentage, wow. and four shutouts, and has been, without question, the biggest reason for the sudden turnaround for the St. Louis Blues. Uh, really, really nice to see production from uh, Tarasenko as well. He, he was really slow coming out of the gates uh, towards the start of the season. Named the NHL's second star of the week, uh, Mr. Crosby and Kucherov, the other two. So, in good company. Uh, but racking up four goals, six assists in four games played uh, last week to be named the NHL's second star. So things coming together. They're getting good goaltending right now. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter who they throw in there, no, apparently. not really. Um, including someone we've never even heard of. Uh, <laughs> and then Vladimir Tarasenko. So you're getting that top-end production from your forwards. You're getting the goaltending, like you said, 11 of their last 12. Uh, and getting W's. In other barns yeah. too, like they're mm-hmm. they're what I think seventeen and nine uh, away from from home ice. So uh, things are coming together in a in a pretty top heavy central. Yeah. We knew we knew Winnipeg would be there. We knew Nashville would be there. Yeah, uh, and uh, what they've leapfrogged the Stars now. They've got four points on them uh, at the right time. So that's when you sort of force management's hands a little bit. Like, yeah. could, could they be players? You've got these bubble teams. All of a sudden, you go from my goodness, are we going to have to sell off parts to Hey, we got a chance at this thing. So, uh, not even in a wild card spot, squeaking into to one of the top three in the central. Uh, could they be players? We'll see. And Vladimir Tarasenko was one of those guys. There was, you know, with with the awful first half of the season that the St. Louis Blues had, there was some talk. I mean, obviously he's he's the biggest name mm-hmm. on the roster. Uh, you know, tons of talent could help any team uh, with his offensive skill. He was one of those guys, and, and you know, and on top of that, a pretty reasonable contract yeah. would not be putting a lot of teams in like too bad of handcuffs if they decided to bring him over. Um, so he was someone who was being talked about a little bit. You were starting to hear in conversations. You never would have thought that Vladimir Tarasenko would have been someone that the St. Louis Blues would even consider trading. Mm-hmm. You know, the last few years, but that started to creep in. But now with the way they've turned things around, yeah, you got to think. They're they're suddenly buyers, yeah, potentially. And when you you go through the the standings, um, and you've got the like like the we knew that this this Mark Stone and and Matt Duchesne story would be a story even towards the start of the season. They're both pending yeah. UFAs, and we knew Ottawa would not be competitive. Yes, but sometimes out of the gate, you've got those surprising teams who are either underperforming, overperforming, and uh, and St. Louis would certainly fit in the category of underperforming to come out of the gate. And that's when you start to hear the big name. Who? What? What is the most attractive asset on a team that is clearly not going anywhere? And you know that they're going to start getting phone calls from from rival GMs. Um, I mean, in the in the Western Conference, uh, even in the Eastern Conference, Columbus making things interesting. And then you hear the names like Sergei Bobrovsky, uh, Artemi Panarin, uh, Derek Broussard from the uh, from the Panthers, even though he was recently acquired. Uh, Kevin Hayes from the Rangers. All those teams. That aren't going anywhere, uh, and you've got the big names. You'll start to hear them thrown around. Another Western Conference one, Duncan Keith, yeah, uh, the Blackhawks, um, who are also turning it on as of late. Uh, but you'll start to hear those names come up, and Tarasenko's was certainly one of them. Yeah, but now you got to think, okay, uh, let's get another piece in here and and play someone alongside him and, and make a run at this. Yeah, the Chicago Blackhawks are. A pretty interesting situation. Uh, very similar to the St. Louis Blues. Had an absolutely atrocious start to the season. You thought by, you know, mid-season, it was going to be, uh, you know what? Mm-hmm. Maybe they missed their opportunity to really 
kind of blow up this team and, uh, you know, stay competitive yeah. and, and just start to sell off that, that core from those those three cup championships mm-hmm. a little bit earlier. Um, two of those core guys, and they've been the core guys, you know, along with Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook, right from the start of this uh, this current Chicago iteration, Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves have been phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Patrick Kane is having another fantastic season. Jonathan Taves is having one of his best seasons. Uh, really kind of uh, spitting in the face a little bit of those who thought, hey, maybe they're over the hill, maybe they're past yeah. the prime, maybe the Chicago Blackhawks held on to these guys a little bit too long. If you were to look at the NHL standings right now, you see the Chicago Blackhawks are still sitting in last place in the Central Division, but that is a bit misleading. They're only three points right. out of the final wild card spot yeah. in the West. Really, anything could happen. And when you've got that much experience and veteran leadership, when you get into tight situations oh, yeah. like these, that that kind of that kind of experience is invaluable. With a game uh, at hand on Vancouver, who's also in the hunt, one point back uh, of the Wild for that eighth and final playoff spot. But yeah, like you said. You squeak into the playoffs, which even even as a top seeded team, you figure it's probably going to be Nashville or, or or Winnipeg. You don't want to play Chicago. You don't want well, you don't want Chicago as a first round matchup. Not necessarily. No. Corey Crawford uh, could be returning to the lineup soon. You're always going to get production out of uh, Kane and Taves, but I think a lot of people were sort of pointing to them as like the blueprint for if you commit too much money because they they yeah. had those identical uh, cap hits, I believe, Kane right. and Taves. Yep. This is what happens when you commit too much money to a couple people. You, you, yes, you have an obvious window of contention. Yeah, what happens afterwards? And yeah. you've got these long, heavy contracts, and you can't sort of surround them with with other quality players. Um, but we were talking about them as if they were out of contention yeah. now, when they're playing some pretty good hockey, eight and two in their last ten, and making a real run of things. You kind of got to think if you're if you're a Chicago Blackhawks fan or. Um... You know, uh, if you're the Chicago Blackhawks GM, just hypothetical situation. What what do you, what is the best option in this situation? Again, you're three points out of a final wild card spot. You're you're really coming on. You eight and two in your last ten. You've got these core guys, these veteran guys that you know have got it done in the past. They're a bit long in the tooth. Do you just do you just kind of steam ahead and mm. see what happens? See if you can get one more good run mm. out of this core group i, I mean it, it's kind of a weird situation like if, if you're if you're someone who's looking already towards the future of this team because i mean let's be honest this core group is they are long in the tooth yep they're not going to be around they're not going to be the players that they were you know five six years ago uh forever obviously mm. they're they're coming towards the twilight of their career it's it's an odd situation because you want your team to always be good. You want them to be good into the future, but it's like, do we do we just kind of keep this together because it's going well right now? It, it's a it's a really I, I find it more interesting for the Chicago Blackhawks from their side of things because they've been there before. Mm-hmm. They know that those guys were big enough pieces to bring home championships in the past. Yeah, do you just let it ride? Uh, titles in what 2010 2013 2015 and 2015 yeah, yeah deep deep runs in in other years and this was a season you know not without controversy right they they lose their head coach Joel Quenville yep. um but if there was any ever a, a type of guys that are are going to rally around that it's it's those veteran guys and and we'll see it sometimes at the trade deadline uh, yeah of course you want to try to acquire a, a dynamic winger a center if they're available i mean they come at a premium a lot of times it's that veteran guy, that locker room presence that sort of gives you the edge, that tested grizzly vet, right? Yeah. Um, and other like they haven't stripped off too many parts of, of uh the core yeah. that, that would have that would have gone uh for all three of those title runs. You've got the main pieces there. They could be poised for another run. I also don't know that they have too much in the cupboard. If they mm. if they wanted to add you know, to to be buyers right now and and maybe see what happens and try and make a run. I don't really know what the Blackhawks have right. that they could potentially give up. Yeah, and if you do decide to give that up, are you just further handcuffing yourself for the future? Right. It's it's a really it's an interesting position that that team is in right now. Um, heading looking over to the East, Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, another one of these teams we've been talking about recently. Uh, third place currently in the Metropolitan Division. There's been this ongoing thing. 
Should they look to trade Artemi Panarin? Mm-hmm. He doesn't seem to have any interest in re-signing with the club, or mm-hmm. at least it's a very uh, reserved interest. Yeah, he's definitely definitely seems to be leaning towards exploring free agency right. uh, with the laugh, laugh, chuckle, yeah. chuckle remote possibility of signing back in Columbus after all that. Uh, they're tied with a team that is unfortunately for them named the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah. Uh, who have kind of a history of getting things done mm. and uh, making the playoffs. And then there's a bunch of jerks called the <laughs> Carolina That's Hurricanes right. just one point back of them. So the Columbus Blue Jackets, though they are in third place right now in the Metropolitan Division, are in anything but a comfortable situation and haven't even been playing particularly great as of late. Yeah, yeah. If they were, and, and, and there was a stretch where they were playing really good hockey. Yeah. Uh, not Not even too long ago, not in the... The distant rear view, but uh, and that's that's where management kind of has to make a decision. Um, but yeah, like you said, Artemi Panarin, a hundred percent wants to test free agency. And when asked about the notion of possibly resigning with Columbus, literally laughed off the question. So that doesn't inspire a whole bunch of confidence. Another UFA for them coming up, of course, is their their backbone uh, in the in the in the crease in in Sergei Bobrovsky. Yep. Uh, who who knows uh, could be the you know countrymen have enjoyed playing together and and might want to continue playing together but it might be in a different destination uh so artemi panarin clearly the the crown jewel of this uh trade deadline class if you want to call it that uh would be the person you figure rival gms would want to snag the most uh has been tied to tampa i have i have no idea how they could possibly pull that off um, another interesting one. I think Tampa just likes to insert their names in yeah. conversations. It's Not, like they're we're already like miles better than everyone else, but ah, let's just throw our names. In completely there. running away <laughs> with this thing. Uh, and I, I've even heard uh, rumors of them trying to acquire uh, Matt Duchesne in mm. an attempt to maybe keep Artemi Panarin around, which is looking increasingly less likely these days another player the tampa bay lightning have been reportedly sniffing around about is wayne simmons Mm. who is a member of our final toi team of interest Ah. the philadelphia flyers uh another one we've been talking about the last couple weeks they've been really hot since the all-star break as well eight one and one in their last 10 still though six points back of the final wild card spot in the east which is i mean there's there's a there's over 20 games left mm-hmm. in the regular season, but six points, although it seems small, that is a, that's a lot of yeah. room to make up, especially when you got teams ahead of you that are not only trying to stay competitive in the race as well, but hopefully advance yeah. in the standings a bit. Six points is, is not going to be easy. So you've no. got to think now, if you're the Philadelphia Flyers, it is a major time to weigh your options. I think they were kind of enjoying seeing where this little run was going to go. But now you really with just over twenty games left, you really got to get serious. Obviously, again, one week until the trade deadline, do you move Wayne Simmons? Yeah, I I, I would think they would. I think the um, answer is yes. Yes, and and we mentioned uh, Artemi Panarin and Matt Duchesne, probably the two most sought after uh, players right now. I would put Wayne Simmons just a peg below them. Yeah, uh, if you're. Uh, and and heck, he could easily be swallowed up by one of these uh, East contenders. You know, someone like Boston would love to have someone of of Wayne Simmons' ability on their club. Yeah, um, all the kind of familiar names seem to be sniffing around these yes. players, like Boston, Winnipeg, Toronto, yeah. Tampa. They all are. They're all having conversations with uh, with the Philadelphia Flyers, yeah. without question. I believe uh, the Knights might be in on, on oh, the Wayne Simmons uh, sweepstakes okay. as well. They were there was another top tier. Um, a trade a candidate that they were that they were tied to and, and had significant interest in, but yeah, like you said, it's it's going to be contenders uh, teams that believe they just need that one other piece to give them that that competitive edge. Um, the Metropolitan is is certainly interesting. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, Philly has a little too much ground to cover, but in the top three, um, you know, Columbus, Washington, New York, fairly wide open. You you figure Tampa's going to run away with the Atlantic. Uh, it's probably going to be one of Calgary or, or San Jose in the Pacific, and uh, you would think probably Winnipeg, maybe Nashville in the Central. So the Metropolitan will be pretty interesting down the stretch. One week to go. We will see. NHL trade deadline. Who knows what will happen? We are going to come back with a full Canada Winter Games recap with Mr. Ollie Williams. That is next on Cabin Sports Radio. 
You're listening to Cabin Sports Radio, brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. Big day for Team NT down at the Canada Winter Games in Red Deer. Team NT's Ren Acorn trying to make the final in the women's 1500 meter speed skating. Ollie Williams is down there covering all the action and we throw it to him now. Thanks, Lecter. Welcome along to Red Deer. We're almost through three days of competition, and I've got more about Ren Acorn in the speed skating coming up. The last event of the day for Team NT, which is the male hockey team playing Nunavut, is going on right now. And I'll start with a quick update on the hockey. Liam Taraposki, the Team NT goalie, is having an incredible tournament. Team NT actually led against Newfoundland for most of its opening game, despite being outshot 2-1. to one. That's how well Liam played, eventually the team lost to Newfoundland 5-3. PEI beat NT 3-2 as well. But the Territory got its first win on the board yesterday evening against Yukon, which is now 0-3 for the tournament. Hoping for the win tonight against Nunavut 2, it's looking like that'll mean the next game will be a placement round on Wednesday. On to other things, and let's head to Biathlon. Super cold first race for Team NT's three athletes yesterday. Minus 30 with the wind chill. Callista and Danica Burke finished 19th and 25th in their race, respectively, out of 40, which is pretty good, but not as strong as they would want. Spencer Littlefair was 30th out of 37 in his race. I spoke to him afterwards while we trudged back to the car in the bitter cold. Cold enough filming you out there. What was it like being involved in that? Uh, the body wasn't too bad. It was kind of warm. Fingers stayed warm, which is good, but lost feeling in my face for uh, uh, about halfway into the race. Got a little hard to make facial expressions and breathe, but other than that, it was it was fairly warm. How do you feel about your race? Shooting wasn't very good, but the uh, rest of it was all right. It's forecast to warm up a little bit as the week goes on. How much of a difference do you think that might make for your remaining events? I feel like it'll make a fair bit because warmer temperatures, to wear less clothes, don't have to worry about uh, getting too cold so your the warm muscles can uh, move and fire off easier than when they're icicles. So it should allow to be faster. Maybe just a little more fun, eh? Oh, definitely more fun too. Being able to feel your face is nice. That's Spencer Littlefair. He and the other biathletes have two races left. In gymnastics, the NWT's girls finished last in their team final, but boy, did they ever have to battle just to finish the thing in one piece. To give you some idea, they lost one athlete in the warm-up. That was Natalie Schaefer. You're going to hear from her explaining what happened in a second. Maggie Carson was the flag bearer for Team NT, but she has a foot problem, so she just did the uneven bars and then sat out the rest of it. So that's two down after one apparatus out of four. The other gymnast again, injured was Lindsay Woodford who had a real tumble getting off the beam at the end of her routine and pretty much had to limp back to her chair but she managed to soldier on and complete the thing and the the two other gymnasts emerged relatively unscathed but everyone had a really tough afternoon it wasn't just the injuries but also falls from the apparatus having to get back up and keep on going in the kind of atmosphere with the kind of crowd that very few if any of those gymnasts have ever seen before so it was a really really tough day natalie schaefer uh, is one of the athletes who suffered the most she had a really bad fall in the warm-up here's her telling the story of what happened to her and how she feels about the rest of her team getting through that afternoon i was doing my dismount and it's like a it's called a toe on front tuck dismount and i have been like in practice i always landed like i kept under rotating and landing on my butt so i wasn't expecting to go very high but um at that point i decided to do a good one and i went like way higher than i was expecting and I uh, didn't know where I was and then I landed and my knees were completely straight and I twisted my ankle a little bit. Um, I thought when I landed I thought I was going to be okay like I was like you know it's a, it's just a little bit of a like a sprain or something I can keep going it's not it's not that bad and then I started to try and get up and I was like no I, <laughs> I, I don't think I can do this and then I saw my coach's head like right on top of me and he, yeah and he said my dismount was really high so I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> I think we've gone through so much already and I just think we're we're a bunch of warriors and we just 
push through it and we go through it together so it's okay <laughs> That is gymnast Natalie Schaefer. Table tennis is into day three today. Singles action with a mixture of wins and losses so far for the six NWT athletes on the team. And in speed skating, this afternoon saw Ren Acorn in semi-final action with the chance of a place in the finals. For a recap of what happened next, I spoke to former NWT Canada Games speed skater Hannah Clark. Unreal, yeah. Super smart skating, very tactical, confident, um... Ren was at the front and took advantage of a crash and put herself in a qualifying position for that A final. Now she came up to see us uh, in between the semi final and the A final, just hanging out, chatting, munching on an apple, watching the other races go on. She looked so confident. She looked way more confident than I would be in those circumstances. <laughs> yeah, she was. I think she was excited, excited, um, and she's been at races and competitions with these girls before, so she knew who she was up against in the A and was excited to be facing them again. So, yeah. Okay, so we, we get to the final, and it starts off looking pretty good, right? Oh, yeah. She was in the front, um, top four, moving around. Every time people were passing, she was aware of it. Really, really smart. Okay, now... There's a big incident coming up in a second, but before we get to that, there was a little bit of uh, what we in the UK would refer to as argy-bargy, a little bit of shoulder action coming down the straight at one moment. Now, how did you see that? Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say it was out of the unusual or out of the usual. Um, one of those things? Yeah, one of those things. It happens in short track. You're going to be in close quarters. Um, Ren did have some contact, but... She did uh, move her feet and kept building off that speed, so it didn't affect her too much. Okay, now, if that was a little bit of contact, this is a lot of contact. Obviously, this is the worst possible fate for anyone in a final. What happened? Uh, it looks like there was another skater from Ontario trying to make a pass who was a couple um, skaters ahead of Wren. Ended up clipping blades, went down, and took out some of the skaters behind her. All right, so you can imagine that Wren probably felt a little, uh, a little frustrated by that. Let's hear from her now. Let's talk semi-final first. That looked like one of the most confidence-boosting skates you could have had. Oh, my gosh. It really, really was. Um, I knew it was a really tough race going in. Like, my competitors were insanely able. All of them are super fast, super good, really smart. So, uh, actually, before the warm-up, like tensions were running high everyone was acting like it was a race coming up because everyone was so stressed out because we knew it would be really slim for who got to advance to the a final so i got out there decided to be super reactive uh build on the outside when needed and actually my goal was to get into the b final to so to hold third or fourth position and um but it's short track anything can really happen so i kind of got lucky there but i was in a good position so that if something like that did happen, I would be fortunate enough to make that advancement. So that was good. <laughs> yeah, it is short track and things happen all the time. And then you were on the other end of that in the final yeah. where there really wasn't anywhere for you to go. And that was the end of your race. How do you feel about it? Um, honestly, I made an A final at CWG. So no matter how that race went, I would have still been happy with it. Um, my goal was really just to do the best I could against those girls. Um, you had some World Cup skaters in there, some of the top in the country. So it's amazing to get to race against them, and I've never been in a national A final before, so that was a great experience. And, it, yeah, it was just so amazing. But, honestly, things happen. The mindset for the whole week is just to move forward positively. Uh, no peaks, no valleys, no matter the results, uh, and just work through everything. It's like stuff happens you just got to work through it four years ago when you were watching team nwt at the 2015 canada games i had a chat to you after that and i asked you what, what you were thinking and you were like well i want to go to the 2019 canada games right check and then you said i want to be an olympian how how do you feel like part b of that project is going um honestly canada is one, a big country with a lot of people, and two, it's a short track country. So the competition is fierce, especially in short track speed skating, when it's just no margin for error. As Michael Gilday once said at the Olympics, like 
anything can happen, so it's not super reliable. The top person's not always going to be at the top. So, honestly, I feel like I am on a good path. I have amazing support systems in place, but I'm just going to do what I can and push really hard, train really hard, and work towards my goals. Those are dreams, long-term dreams, is to go to the Olympics, yeah. All right, so that's Renee Acorn. So she was talking to me a little bit earlier there. Now, Hannah... From your point of view, she's still got events left here to go. We've still got the 1,000 yeah. metres coming up. How do you think this will set her up for that? Obviously, that's disappointing what just happened. But all in all, the 1,500 metres made her look really strong. She is really strong. And I don't think she'll be disappointed with that final. Um, it's, it's really good to look back and see her making moves in with those girls. So she can look back and work on that in the 500 and the 1,000 this week. That is Hannah Clark talking to me earlier this afternoon. And that's all this week from Red Deer. I'll be back same time next week with more. And there are shorter updates on Cabin Radio's lunchtime news from 12 each weekday. Plus, of course, more on the website. The CSR Podcast. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North. Moving sport forward. Check out sportnorth.com for more on them. And to follow along with all things Canada Winter Games, you just heard a recap from Mr. Ollie Williams. Lots of excitement going down in Red Deer. Go Team NT go, and we will continue to follow that up with him as long as the games happen down in Red Deer. Uh, moving elsewhere, the 68th NBA All-Star Weekend took place in Charlotte this past Saturday and Sunday. Team LeBron beating Team Giannis? Yeah. Is that how you pronounce That's it? A, oh, I, sh- I should have <laughs> written down his last name, Antetokounmpo. Oh, wow, that, yeah. that would have been fun. I, I could have thrown you through a loop, buddy. All right, so you said you watched the game? You yeah. enjoyed it? It was quite good. A little bit of drama. Uh, team Giannis. Now, LeBron's uh, he's he's no rookie when it comes to All Star selections. Uh, Fifteen. He's been there a few times. Yeah, fi- yeah. fifteen All Star yeah. appearances now. Uh, Giannis is is relatively new to the scene, and this was his first time being a captain. Uh, and we broke down the uh, NHL uh, All Star Weekend a couple weeks ago, uh, and we how we were discussing how we like the new format. You know, yeah. you got the 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 divisions play out against one another, yeah. and then the, go for the. The conference crown and then face off in a final three on three. Who doesn't like three on three? Yeah. Uh, the NBA has likewise undergone a bit of a revision to its uh, format. Um, so players are still voted based on the East West uh, conferences, um, but the top vote getters get to be captains. Uh, so LeBron, who was always a uh, a captain when he was on the uh, other side on the Eastern Conference, naturally doesn't matter what conference he goes over <laughs> to. So now he is naturally the Western Conference captain, uh, which freed up some room for Giannis uh, and Tenacupo, the Greek freak. So he got his first stab at it. Uh, critics coming across saying he did not make nearly as good as picks as Mr. LeBron. Uh, and to be fair... Well, he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't. He doesn't. And to be fair, LeBron's team was absolutely stacked. Uh, Kawhi <laughs> Leonard, Anthony Davis, uh, Kevin Durant, who he took with the, the first pick. Uh, Kyrie Irving, who he won a championship with. Not to say that there wasn't much firepower on the other side, but it just paled in comparison a little bit. Uh, and that's saying a lot when you got like Steph Curry, Joel Embiid, Paul George on the other side, just not the same superstar uh, caliber of, of players. Anyways, it was uh, Giannis's team who uh, got out ahead early, established a 20-point lead, uh, but then coughed it up late. It was LeBron's team coming out on top. No chemistry problems between LeBron and Kyrie. They were able to, uh, to keep it under control. They they had a man to man conversation over oh, the did tele- they? Yeah, Kyrie called him a couple weeks ago, apologized to him. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, it was a, a, a well documented. You know, okay. and, and they're in a good place according oh, to LeBron good. right now. Uh, Kevin Durant named MVP team high thirty one points. Giannis uh, game high thirty eight points, and a very good showing for his first time as captain. I'm sure he will be a captain for the Eastern Conference. For a long time, I would say one of the cooler scenes uh, from the whole weekend, uh, aside from Jay Cool uh, at the <laughs> halftime show and almost throwing down a dunk in the uh, the slam dunk contest, uh, we get to say goodbye uh, to Dwayne Wade, uh, who is retiring at season's end. Um, same with Dirk Nowitzki. I don't believe he's officially come out and said it, uh, but if his performance and body is any indication. <laughs> He's probably on the way out uh, as well. So, uh, Adam, and I thought he was 48 years old already. So pretty. Yeah, yeah, the, the fact that he's still playing, yeah, just incredible. I don't know if the t- I know Wade is 37. I I don't know. He so he was part of the same draft class as LeBron, the the stacked 2003 draft class. I want to say Nowitzki was drafted in 99. I I don't actually know off the top. He's of my that head. young still, eh? Wow. Uh, 
Uh, nine drafted in ninety nine. I'd put him in his early forties, maybe forty one. Oh, okay. I I, right. I could be totally making that up. Um, <laughs> but he came out guns a blazing. Uh, hit his first three three pointers. That was all she wrote. He finished with nine points. Uh, Dwayne <laughs> Dwayne Wade uh, finished with seven. Had a really nice connection on a LeBron alley oop. It was like we were in a time machine back like in we there, back in South Beach, Miami days. My God, yeah, it was it was good. Uh, so we get to say goodbye to them, but obviously the the game is in very good hands with a great crop of young and and current uh, superstars. So a pretty fun weekend. Recap of the uh, the skills challenge. Yeah, so Team USA, as we said earlier. I need stupid detail about the winning slam dunks. Right, so uh, not that we have overdone this enough, <laughs> but the the Superman idea, right? You had the original Superman, Mr. Shaquille O'Neal, seven foot two, three twenty in his prime, At probably. Least? He was a big guy. In, in, in shape? Uh, yeah. In shape, I would say, yes. Uh, in the latter years, oh boy. He might have been pushing 350. We, I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, Hamadou Diallo of uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder dunked over Shaq. He, uh, yeah, he pulled. Oh him. wow! Yeah, yeah. So Shaq was not one of the five judges. Uh, he was just as he always is, you know, looking good, dressed up, yeah, uh, sitting courtside. And that's when this young, uh, this young kid from OKC pulls him out, puts him right on the, um, right on the little circle, the defensive circle underneath the hoop, and uh, gets him to, to bow his head a little bit, turn him around, <laughs> dunk over him, hung from the net, uh, from the rim, rather, with his elbow, and oh that's when he, he pulled open his shirt to reveal a Superman. Uh, oh. Yeah, because, of course, we had Dwight Howard do the same thing. And right. Then, uh, Nate Robinson, uh, he, when he came out as Kryptonite, you know? Yeah. So uh, we just keep doing the Superman to death, but, uh, hey, as long as you're jumping and dunking over seven-footers, People want to see it. Last week on uh, on on Sports Center, I don't know if you saw it, but they were doing the uh, the top ten dunks of mm. all time, and, yes. I, and I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it, but of course, number one, Vince Carter, yeah, classic the through the legs windmill dunk, yeah. Uh, that and I was talking to Jesse about this the next day. That was that was such a moment for Canadian mm. basketball. You know, like he was Vince Carter was already a huge star, but then. You got on that the stage. Everyone was watching oh, yeah. NBA All Star Game slam dunk competition, and he pulls off something that I don't know if we had seen before, mm-hmm. but he did it just so spectacularly and with so much just coolness oh, to yeah. him. And I think like that moment like inspired a whole generation of Canadian oh, basketball totally. players. Like I remember watching that as a kid. Didn't inspire me to play basketball, but I was like, man, Vince Carter is mm. the coolest. And and people will still emulate him, and, and many people will still consider him the greatest in-game dunker of all time. I think even Michael Jordan had a quote this past week. Doesn't understand uh, why he would always look forward to that. Uh, yeah, actually, sorry, no, it was Vince Carter uh, who said he always looked forward to that event, and he would always, if he could, participate. It's more so the younger guys now. You're seeing yeah. a lot of rookies and sophomores. Not that they don't have bounce, and they're putting on shows, uh, but you don't see like the top tier you know, superstar type players participating as much as we used to. Right. It's more of the younger guys, but hey, still uh, putting on a show. And I guess just lastly, the three-point uh, shootout. Joe Harris mm. uh, arrived on the scene of the, the Brooklyn Nets, beat Steph Curry wow. in the final. Okay. A very impressive showing for a team that's actually on the up. Okay. Just going to transition uh, quickly to CFL free agency. That's been going on uh, since this past weekend. Um, lots of moves happen already. Uh, just before we go to break here, just going to recap a few of the bigger moves. Uh, Mike Riley, who we were talking about last week, the mm. rumor was that he was going to sign with the BC Lions. He did immediately upon the free agency time opening, and the Lions then went to work surrounding him with receiver talent, signing Lamar Durant away from the Calgary Stampeders, Deron Carter, and uh, re-signing Brian Burnham just days before. So Mike Riley will have plenty of weapons surrounding him heading into this season. Uh, Manny Arsenault, however... Uh, headed to Saskatchewan. Edmonton responded by signing Trevor Harris immediately and sur- surrounded him with receivers Devaris Daniels, also from the Calgary Stampeders, Ricky Collins, and Greg Ellingson. Uh, a huge blow to the Ottawa Red Blacks mm-hmm. losing him. Ottawa responded to that by signing Jonathan Jennings, the quarterback who should and has had the potential to be a legit starter in this league for years now, maybe he will find that 
kind of form in Ottawa. Who knows? Uh, BC lost Jeremiah Johnson. He signed with the Montreal Alouettes. My Bombers took a few pretty big blows, mm. losing uh, Suk Chung to BC, Taylor Loeffler to the Montreal Alouettes, and Jovan Santos Knox to the Edmonton Eskimos. And uh, finally, the other biggest uh, biggest headline to come out of the weekend. Apparently, Calgary's Bo Levi Mitchell, who is still looking south of the border, trying to land an NFL spot, reportedly was offered somewhere in the neighborhood of $800,000 by the Toronto Argonauts, Mm. which by CFL standards is a pretty massive contract. No word as to how he has responded or what he is going to respond with. But we shall see as the CFL free agency season continues. Back for one more on Cabin Sports Radio. Going to talk about a bunch of jerks. The Cabin Sports Radio Podcast. Brought to you by Sport North. Moving sport forward. Just uh, touching on a little bit more NHL before the end of the show. Um, We're going to talk about Grapes' rant on the Carolina Hurricanes. He's Mm. still... Still going on about it. He does not like young men expressing themselves. After we heard from Brian Burke last <laughs> time around, old white dudes don't like when young guys have fun. They hate it. No. They can't stand it. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, another jerk. Another mean guy. Yeah. First of all, uh, NHL Twitter account tweeted out something this past Saturday, which was uh, basically a tweet comparing the New York Islanders win loss record last season, which was not great to their win-loss record this season, which is phenomenal. They are 35-17-6, and six, first in the Metropolitan Division, and uh, the tweet was captioned, the Barry Trotz effect, who is, of course, the coach, Stanley Cup winning coach last year with the Washington Capitals, now the head coach of the New York Islanders and having incredible positive effects on that team. But former NHLer and Edmonton Oilers first-round draft pick Rob Shrimp mm. Decided to frame it a different way. <laughs> he uh, captioned, he responded to the tweets and captioned it, or uh, the <laughs> the ultimate I did my job yeah. kind of superstar. He decided to look at it uh, as the Islanders record with or without former captain and now Toronto Maple Leaf, John Tavares. Mm. He then elaborated saying the ultimate, uh, quote, I did my job kind of superstar he wins when he goes to play for his country as they're loaded with players mostly equal or better other than that he just collects his points and his awards ouch yeah uh rob shrimp in case you don't know that might (laughs) not be a name that you've heard associated with the nhl for quite some time he was one of these players that was a uh, a pretty hot shot player coming out of junior as i mentioned was a first round draft pick for the edmonton oilers back in 2004 25th overall, played a total of seven games for the Oilers in three seasons, racking up three assists. Wow. He then moved to the New York Islanders and played on the team for parts of John Tavares' first two NHL seasons after Tavares was drafted by the New York Islanders, was then traded to Atlanta, finished off the NHL portion of his pro career, and uh, has been basically playing, bouncing around different European elite leagues since then, uh, right up until now. He's actually played this season in Austria, Mm. of all places. Um, Interesting words from Rob Trump. Not really sure what prompted them, but obviously there's there's a history here. He played Mm -hmm. with John Tavares for parts of two seasons. You gotta wonder what happened there. Maybe he was a a young vet and was looking at this young hotshot rookie, and I don't know. It's interesting. Well, it is interesting, especially uh, when you take into consideration that he was playing with him for the parts of his first two seasons. Yeah. Like right, right when he's breaking into the league, when, uh, you know, you would think he wouldn't have established such an ego by this point. He's trying to he's trying to make a name for himself. Right. Um, and he's literally right out of, out of minor league hockey. Uh, Tavares, I don't think he's too bothered. Uh, 305 career goals, 379 career assists for almost 700 uh, career points. Yeah, uh, I don't think he's about to get too rattled no. by what Rob Shrimp had to say about him anytime soon. Uh, mm. But interesting that that the way he frames it, the ultimate mm. "I did my job" kind of superstar. Now, who knows that that could have been you know his take on on John Tavares in in New York, where it was long thought that he was not necessarily surrounded by the equivalent talent. Right. But you look at the club this year without John Tavares. 
it's yeah they made some some changes mm-hmm. in addition you know they had to respond and uh and and, and make moves to to fill in for losing uh Tavares in the off season right but not a whole lot different from past years but the record their record is remarkably different mm-hmm. they are having an incredible season uh Anders Lee is the captain of the team now. I don't know if anyone necessarily expected him to be named team captain, but he has taken it, and he is running with it, and he's doing a fantastic job. Um, I don't know why uh, why there would be really a reason for bitterness, though, especially Rob Shrimp. You you wouldn't think he's really got a vested interest in what John Tavares is doing, and and maybe maybe he's a big Toronto Maple Leafs fan, and he's not comfortable with John Tavares, yeah. uh, pro, you know his presence on this team, I don't know. It might be one of those whole like addition by subtraction philosophies. You know, like you lose a centerpiece, your captain, in someone like John Tavares. Other guys are put in a position where they they have to step, step up. Step he, up. He's yeah. not there. Um, and we've we've seen uh, Barzell, who had an excellent uh, rookie season, uh, just continues to become a better hockey player. But yeah. how can you how can you take away from the fact that they they gained? A, a seasoned, experienced Stanley Cup winning coach uh, behind yeah. the bench, that is going to pay immediate dividends, and I think that's what we're seeing in New York. Yep. By the way, John Tavares is, uh, meanwhile, enjoying a career <laughs> year with the Toronto Maple Leafs. 33 goals, 63 points in 58 games. Yeah, he's fit in rather seamlessly. <laughs> and I think he's having a lot of fun doing it yeah. back in his hometown. All right, we are going to finish off, uh, as we mentioned, old white guys, Don Cherry, <laughs> Brian Burke, mm. not big fans of the Carolina Hurricanes. Their uh, post-game celebrations continue to evolve. Mm-hmm. They are having all kinds of fun, but Don Cherry, not a fan of young men expressing themselves. What is going? On? These are these are old, you know they're old school, right? Uh, and and we're seeing it uh, in the National Basketball Association as well. Uh, rivals are friends off of the court. Um, I don't know. What a terrible thing. Right. It, My it, God. In the age of, of social media, they know what sort of platforms they have. Their horizons are have endlessly expanded, uh, you know, since since these dinosaurs were playing. <laughs> and uh, and they hate the idea that they actually have fun. They're not just going in. It's not blue collar work. They're going in, working hard, collecting their paycheck and walking out. They're enjoying their lives. They're having fun. They're putting on a show for their fans. Uh, but. But these old guys, they, they just don't like it. Yeah, we talked about it, I think, a couple weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't mind it myself. I think it's, yeah, maybe they're, they're a little over the top. Mm. If, you, uh, if you type YouTube, uh, Carolina Hurricane Celebrations, they're a little bit over the top. They, they're, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're having a bit of fun, taking a bit of liberties with the whole post-game celebration mm. thing. But you know what? They're having fun. They're winning games. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if they're drawing more fans, but yeah. I, I got to think they're not necessarily turning fans away when in else, a market like that. When else at this time of the year would we be talking about the Carolina Hurricanes? Absolutely. All right. All the right. third youngest team in the league, they're having fun. That's absolutely it. Now, let's hear from the old curmudgeon himself, Don Cherry, uh, on this past weekend's edition of Coach, Coach's Corner. This is going to finish off the show. We will talk to you next week here on Cabin Sports Radio. Brenda Moore is a good coach. He play. These guys, to me, are jerks. You have to do this in the next. They're still not drawn. This is to me, and I'll tell you one thing, they better not do this in the playoff. What I don't understand is Brenda Moore is a street shooter. He always was. This is a joke. The, you know, the rest of the guys, young men expressing themselves for joy of winning. They don't do this thing in the net. It's professional hockey. Yeah. One of these guys are jerks or something. And I'll tell you one thing. They do this in the playoffs, making fun of the other team. But They're nobody's out team. on the ice. The game's over. I admit, I always liked your uh, theory of when you celebrate when you win only. Uh, that's why you like Muhammad Ali, whereas uh, Sugar yeah, Ladder did this. before. Trouble. Now, you don't. If you want to do it, do it before. But wow. that, that is absolutely ridiculous. I know the rest of the people. I know all the broadcasters and everything are afraid to say something like that. They're jerks well, doing it. I like it. I know you... <laughs> well, you're lucky. I, the weatherman, you know what I mean? I know what I'm talking about. You never do anything like that. They're still not drawn. They're a bunch of jerks as far as I'm concerned.